So recently, as I was going through the archive of the museum that I work at, I came across a box of what I thought were business cards. But after a little bit of digging, I realized that what I had actually stumbled across was an entire box of calling cards. A calling card, or a visiting card, is a small, formal piece of paper with a name written on it. And much like modern business cards, it might have an address or an occupation underneath it. So what exactly were these used for? Like so much of Victorian culture, these cards were wrapped in various customs and forms of etiquette that if you didn't follow it precisely, it could result in a form of social suicide. There are different rules for different occasions, different rules for women delivering cards to women, women delivering cards to men, rules for mourning, etiquette for the prefixes, so many different rules. So let's break these down into the simplest parts. Men's cards and women's cards often looked a little bit different, and of course there was also even more rules of how a card could look. Men's cards were generally smaller, which is thought to be so that they could easily fit into a breast pocket. The name of a club, or if they were in the navy, the name of the ship might be in the bottom left-hand corner, and in the bottom right there might be an address. I've read that prefixes denoting rank or titles are frowned upon for these cards, but all of the ones I've seen firsthand are generally denote who they were, so I'm going to mark that down as a uh, difference based on location. Now, cards for women were in general a little bit larger. According to Cards, Their Significance and Proper Uses by Abby Longstreet, women's cards should be white, flexible, and with no ornamentation. It was imperative that the Miss or Mrs. prefix be added before the name. Just as with men's cards, there might be an address, but on the left there may be written a day of the week, which signifies that this is when the lady is at home and available to take callers during that day. During a young woman's first season out in society, her name would be engraved under her mother's name, the Miss prefix. It was not good form for the young lady to have callers without her mother for the first year or two out in society. Therefore, she did not require her own card. Yet. In general, these cards were printed with the help of an engraved plate. But it isn't uncommon to see various like handwritten notes in pencil or the addition of other names as people would visit in groups. You might also see the initial PPC in the one corner of the card. This represents the French pour prendre conge, pour prendre conge, <laughs> that's bad, I'm really sorry, French, <laughs> or to take leave, which would be handwritten in to signify that the individual was leaving town. I, honestly though, I think that my favorite part of these cards, and the whole reason that I find them so interesting, is a strange little detail that actually is part of the story of how I got involved in all of this. We all know that the Victorians were extra with their mourning practices. While their mourning practices were so etiquette-centered, they allowed their mourning and grief to sort of permeate through all of their customs, including their stationery. Slightly off topic, but they would actually have like their paper and envelopes engraved with a black border to signify that they were in mourning. Not only that, if the border was thick, it could mean two things. Either that the grief was fresh, or that it was the loss of someone who was very close to you. Because of this, you see stationery with differing thicknesses of the border as people experience different levels of grief. And this extends into the art of the calling card as well. If you received a card with a black border, it meant that the individual who had sent it was still in mourning and may be unavailable for calls at this time. These cards would be delivered generally in person to someone's home. If you wished to see your friend, you would hand off your card to the servant at the front door who would either pass the note on right away, or they would leave it in a tray in the front hall for the individual to see when they are not presently engaged. The card tray became something of a modern follower list on social media. You could see who had called upon an individual, so the cards were generally organized in such a way that the more esteemed individuals who had called on you were placed at the top. The trays themselves were often quite a spectacle, being rather ornate and fancy. Let us for a moment imagine ourselves in the 19th century. You are a young, well-to-do person, and you wish to call upon your friend to see if they are available for a visit at their earliest convenience. Allow me to read from the Ladies' Book of Etiquette and Manual of Politeness by Florence Hartley, which I will, I will link down below if you want to read more. <coughs> After arriving at your friend's home and ringing the bell, when the servant answers your ring, hand in your card. If your friend is out or engaged, leave the card, and if she is in, send it up. Never call without cards. You may offend your friend, as she may never hear of your call, if she is out at the time, and if you trust to the memory of the servant. Thanks, damn servants. There are dozens more of these tiny rules for ceremonious receptions, etiquette for women invited to weddings and church, for dinners, 
for men's and women's respective introductions, etc, etc. But I just wanted to go over the basics, as this is kind of the basic information that you can glean from a calling card if you ever happen to come across one. So what do these cards mean for us humble historians looking backwards? The trove that I found at the Point Ellis House Museum was like finding gold. It is the modern equivalent of finding somebody's address book. If someone has kept all of their cards, we can discern who actually went and visited this family, but can also corroborate relationships, dates, addresses, marriages, courtships, deaths, and so much more personal information, mainly thanks to the mass of rules of etiquette that these people abided by. This, of course, as I said before, is a very basic overview of calling cards. I did find several really interesting primary sources and books that are available for free, which I will link to in the description down below regarding calling cards if you're interested and want to learn more about these crazy rules. But in the meantime, thanks for watching. Um, if you're one of like the two people that get to the end of the video, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.